Hi, Business 13. This is Professor McLaughlin. Um, this is a lecture on Chapter 4. I know uh, uh, maybe it's a little unorthodox to provide you uh, online lectures, but we're, we're kind of behind according to my own schedule, um, but perfectly okay with getting through Chapter 4 and, and uh, Quiz 1 and Exam 1, and we'll um, just power on from here. So I'm going to give a complete lecture on Chapter 4. I know some of you were not in class and hopefully are listening to this before uh, the exam on Thursday. So this chapter uh, uh, is focused on describing uh, and providing an overview of litigation for you and then uh, providing also an overview of what alternatives to litigation exist and all from the perspective of business planning, certainly from the perspective of understanding all these concepts, um, definitional and how, um, um, how the litigation process works. Um, and then also uh, understanding why, or, or hopefully um, encouraging you to begin to understand why business would choose one dispute resolution method over another. And litigation is a dispute resolution method. Um, and we start with it because um, in US dispute resolution, it really is primary and dominant and all other dispute resolution methods um, are best understood in comparison to it. But I will tell you in other jurisdictions internationally in Western jurisdictions and Eastern countries and countries that are not Anglo-American based, but even England, um, litigation is not the first uh, choice. Uh, arbitration is frequently the first choice or bringing a mediator in is the first choice. Um, so the United States is unique that way and sometimes it gets us into trouble um, with being over litigious, always thinking there's a right to sue, always believing um, that there's a solution in the courts. And that's simply not the case. Frequently um, for personal and business dispute resolution, a, a solution outside the court is preferred, advantageous, the best decision and all that kind of stuff. All right, so let me see if I can forward this slide. Good. Okay. So first we'll talk about how businesses decide to uh, choose a dispute resolution um, method, what the strategic decision is, what the planning decision is, uh, and then kind of go into the details of civil litigation. And then really the two main areas of alternative dispute resolution, which are mediation and arbitration. We've kind of talked in class how litigation is the most adversarial, um, or if we haven't, I'll say it here. <laughs> litigation is the most adversarial way to resolve a dispute. It really is the Armageddon of um, dispute resolution. You uh, frequently, uh, it, it, it is a scorched earth, only one winner um, way to resolve a dispute where, uh, where um, you're represented by counsel, it's very formal, um, but you're really not trying to preserve relationships um, uh, and relationships are destroyed by litigation and business and, and personal relationships. And frequently, even parties who win have uh, still suffered through the process. Uh, it's not meant to be kind and caring. Uh, it is frequently not even meant to achieve justice. The purpose of the litigation is to come up with a process that has rules and procedures that are applied for the most part fairly and evenly um, in a community, in a state, 
or in a, a federal district or region. Um, so it's it's imperfect, but dispute resolution is imperfect in general. I can't hold that against um, litigation in particular. But for businesses, choosing the kind of dispute resolution process is really um, about uh, cost, preserving relationships, formality, privacy, and um, some of the things your book uh, does a good job talking about. And also your book does a good job providing charts for. So I will say in chapter four, um, I do like the tables that the author has created. I think they give you a good idea of um, uh, what business is facing in terms of choosing um, litigation versus a more informal dispute resolution process. And that is uh, specifically table four one on page 96 in your textbook. All right, so civil litigation, uh, this is not criminal, not criminal. Begin to, whenever you feel like coming up with an analogy that's a criminal analogy, right now we're just focused on suing people for harms that occurred that's not a violation against the state. Um, People sue a lot. People sue um, a lot for lots of different reasons. Not to um, beg the question, but uh, as society gets more crowded, as we, as industry grows, and we live in uh, increasingly more urban areas in order to get to jobs and to schools and to opportunities that help us personally or our families. Um, litig litigation has grown. This is, there's also a cultural, as I mentioned, um, there's also a cultural aspect to the growth of litigation. Some states are very litigious, New Jersey, California, New York, um, you can sit and ponder why that is. In the middle of the United States, they sue less. In the South, they sue less. Um, is that, you know, uh, less population, less business location, um, less urban. Uh, it's not a social science class, but there are uh, demographic and cultural reasons why litigation occurs uh, and why people are seeking that, that, that solution. So stages of litigation. In all types of litigation, and I, I used the example of a, a fender bender in our lecture on, on last um, Thursday, that pre-dispute, either demand for payment or settlement negotiations can happen infrequently. It happens all the time. If you're in a dispute with a collector, if you're in a dispute personally or for businesses as well, somebody hasn't paid, um, you either demand payment or you could demand partial payment. Um, and these efforts at resolving the conflict early, uh, you know, can have more formal words like a demand for payment or a settlement negotiation. Um, but uh, I would like you to see um, and look at the stages of litigation um, as progressive and also, at, yes, everybody's progressing toward the hearing, but um, this chapter isn't deep enough and doesn't have enough discussion. I will tell you that uh, what, what parties are really progressing in California toward is settlement, ultimate settlement. They are frequently required to meet with the judge they're required to meet with one another um, in the procedural rules um, before they get to the hearing. And this is an effort to help parties um, settle early, resolve the dispute, uh, and uh, not everybody's gunning for the hearing. So in order for a party to uh, successfully maintain a lawsuit against another party, they need to be injured, in fact, that injury needs to have created a harm 
that harm has to be direct, concrete, individualized, and there has to be the ability to um, provide a legal remedy. So no um, asking the court if God exists, no suing for a broken heart or suing on behalf of somebody else for um, hurt feelings, not really. Um, you have to show an injury. And so after each of these num numerals, there's an and, and you have to show that that injury caused you harm. Um, why do we do that? Don't all injuries cause you harm? Not really. Um, you can get punched and suffer an injury and the harm is a bruise. Um, and really it didn't require any medical treatment. Uh, so what's the legal remedy that, that the court could possibly provide you? Is it a, a psychiatric harm or a, a psychological harm or an emotional harm? Um, and then we need to prove that with facts. Um, and typically with civil litigation, the legal remedy is money, compensating for an injury, compensating for medical bills, um, and that kind of thing. So you, many of you are familiar, for those of you um, who are unfamiliar, let's quickly go through some of the vocabulary in this chapter. The person who sues is the plaintiff. You file a complaint. It's the complainer, that's how you remember it. And you file it with the clerk of court and you get a docket number. Then at the same time, the, the procedural rules require you to let the defendant know you're suing them. And those that paperwork uh, needs to be uh, provided to the court. The court needs to see that you let the defendant know that you're suing them. The defendant is the defender. They may also be called the respondent, but in civil lawsuits, they're typically called the defendant and they could file an answer saying, hey, I didn't do it. I didn't breach the, the contract um, or you're confusing me with somebody else or your facts are wrong or your law is wrong. Um, this pleading stage, this is, this is the beginning stages of litigation. This is all covered by court rules and rules of procedure and just be familiar with um, uh, these uh, this language because we'll talk about it also as we read more cases after exam one. Um, uh, these slides don't hit everything in chapter four, but I do want you to know statute of limitations and some of the other stuff um, that's covered in the chapter. As I mentioned in class today, discovery is what we call that phase of litigation where, okay, I know you're suing me, you let me know that, and now we get to exchange information. It's the, what you see on the slide, depositions, interrogatories, requests for production, requests for admissions. This is all, um, these are all ways we gather information. Depositions are interviews under oath. Interrogatories are questions and they're limited and you don't get to ask about everything under the sun. You can only ask about relevant information. If you want my tax return, it needs to be relevant <clears throat> to the claim that you're bringing against me and not simply a fishing expedition. You may have heard that. Um, trying to get information. I know you did something wrong. I'm not sure what it was, but I'm going to find it out. No, you need to put all your claims in the complaint. You need to know what you're looking for. The discovery stage is an opportunity to find out more specific information that could lead to additional questions. So it is possible at this stage I got your tax return and now like I discover information on your tax return that makes me ask other questions. Uh, maybe it, allow, it causes me to amend my complaint and sue you for something else. Um, so interrogatories are questions, request for production is for production of documents, meaning you must turn them over to me. I want to see them. And then requests for admissions. Admissions are very interesting, specific things where um, you want to get somebody to admit they did something. And frequently parties will do this. 
so that you don't have to argue about it, so that I don't have to go through the trouble of proving it at trial. I'm just going to tell you, yeah, I admit my manager was working on July 1st, the night that um, uh, money was discovered missing from the safe. So you don't have to bring my manager onto the um, witness stand. You don't have to get out his uh, schedule, show his time card to prove that he was there that night. I will admit that that person was there. Or that sounds more like a stipulation. But requests for admissions are admissions that um, alleviate one party um, the responsibility to prove something. Okay, and then we also have motions during litigation. Um, those motions are well described in Table 4-2. Um, I think the only two that are not self-explanatory are the motion for summary judgment and uh, the motion for judgment as a matter of law. So a motion to dismiss, you want to dismiss the case because, you know, the claim cannot be proven, the plaintiff doesn't have standing, the statute of limitations has run. Motion to compel discovery, somebody is telling you that they don't have um, their tax return, they can't find it. Well, the court can order that person to... Um, request it from the IRS to get a copy of it. And if somebody's not going to turn over documents, you can ask the court for help by asking the court to grant you the motion to compel because if it's not, if a court order is not, and that motion is granted and then an order is issued, and if a court order is not followed, the motion is dismissed. Sorry. If the court order is not followed, contempt proceedings um, or sanctions could follow. Okay, sorry, motion, so I was reading the next line. So the motion to dismiss for mistrial is exactly what it sounds like. You put a motion to the court, something went wrong, I'm entitled to, um, you know, you cannot have this jury decided because something really bad went wrong, uh, jury tampering, um, you know, the judge had a conflict of interest that was not previously disclosed, that kind of thing. Uh, and then the motion for judgment as a matter of law. Um, this is very similar to really just setting aside what the jury has decided. So uh, this motion is granted infrequently. Um, and, and what it says is the jury decided, uh, but that decision needs to be set aside because no reasonable jury looking at the evidence presented at trial could have decided the way this jury decided. Um, so it's extraordinary relief, uh, and that's what that is. Um, let me come down back to the, the Bridgestone case. I actually haven't decided uh, what cases to include. Um, I wasn't really. Bridgestone looks super interesting. Um, I am going to include one later case, uh, but uh, let's skip Bridgestone for now, um, and I reserve the right to come back to it. Thanks. Okay. So pretrial conferences, as I mentioned, uh, all conferences prior to trial are an attempt to get the parties together with the judge to encourage settlement, to discuss where you are. If your case is so weak, look, this needs to be settled. Um, to also resolve outstanding motions. Um, typically motions are heard only before the court. Uh, sometimes it's just, you don't even have a hearing. You just submit papers. Um, and the court can decide on the papers. But pretrial conferences um, are held with the intention to get the parties to settle. So the parties don't settle and you go to trial. And at trial, um, 
the judge is the finder of the law and the jury is the finder of the fact. The court gives the law to the jury uh, at the very end of the trial and they know all the facts and they're going to apply that law to the facts that they have discovered during the trial. Um, but motions and objections, those are all legal decisions that only the judge makes. Jury selection is very um, uh, historical, lots of constitutional protections here. Um, we're not going to be able to get into it, but jury selections over the years, um, uh, it's become also uh, scientific with psychologists involved, reading body language and profiling jurors. Um, essentially, each side wants to have a jury that is favorable to their uh, client, the plaintiff or the defendant, um, sympathetic to their issues, um, at the very least will be fair and reasonable. Um, jury selection is done by questioning, jury selection, you're called in to serve jury duty, and then you're asked questions. That questioning process is called wadir. Um, after the jury is selected, uh, then they're impaneled and the uh, trial goes forward and attorneys begin uh, by each um, stating an opening of what this case is about. Plaintiffs go first, followed by defendants. Um, witness testimony is provided, uh, documentar do documentary um, evidence is provided, uh, when you ask the witness direct questions and you are the attorney who called that witness, we call that direct examination. When uh, the opposing counsel, the evil other side is asking that witness questions, we call that cross-examination and we have very specific rules for how you put the question um, on direct examination and very specific rules for how you word the question on cross-examination. Witnesses are introducing their own testamentary um, evidence, which is oral, but they also could be asked to um, authenticate documents, to say that um, this um, contract in front of you is the contract that was drafted by the parties, um, to describe a business process, to describe discussions in a meeting. Uh, authenticating documents is really saying this document, I, you know, this is the original, it's not a fake, it's not a photocopy. Uh, sometimes verifying physical evidence, um, you know, this is the picture frame, uh, or this is the um, laptop, uh, but also charts and graphs. Um, can be shown or, or um, uh, Excel spreadsheets can be shown to the jury and then you can call an expert witness in to describe what's in there. Um, then closing arguments are given and attorneys are summing up the case and they're referring back to facts that are in evidence and testimony that could, came before the juror, trying to be um, persuasive to have the jury decide in their favor. Then the judge charges the jury, giving them instructions on how to apply the facts that they've heard to whatever the jury's charge is. Um, has your book come up with? No, but um, you know the jury could be charged with proving negligence, proving breach of contract. Uh, proving that the contract exists, uh, that kind of thing. And that will, in detail, um, the judge will tell the jury what the law is and the jury applies the facts and comes up with the decision. In civil cases, the burden of proof is preponderance of the evidence. It's kind of which has the most weight, which side had the most evidence, um, persuading you that they proved their point. Jury deliberates, allowed to ask questions, they're alone, they can be sequestered, and then they deliver a verdict. Um, if the jury can't agree, it's a home jury. Um, and yeah, for commercial disputes, you do not need a unanimous verdict. You'll have 
potentially post-trial motions and appeals. Um, the appellate court could reverse or uphold or even modify a trial court's decision. And then the judgment needs to be collected. There's a lot of procedural rules for this. Can I take this judgment to the bank? Can I garnish wages? Um, can I send it to a collection agency? All that kind of stuff. That's in the procedural rules. Um, and what if the business has decided they won't, don't want to do Arm Armageddon litigation and they would like an alternative? And those alternatives are uh, procedures such as arbitration and mediation. Uh, they're very popular. They preserve relationships. They can be less costly, um, shorter. And you um, can have uh, neutrals that preside over these processes that are experts in your field. So you're not spending a lot of time educating a jury. Uh, the decisions are private. Frequently, you cannot search those decisions. Sometimes you can. So arbitration, typically you have three arbitrators, sometimes very rarely you'll have one arbitrator. Um, that looks a lot like mediation. And I will say that sometimes these processes are very similar to one another. So don't be distressed. Sometimes they're um, not, not litigation, but even arbitration can be very litigation-like. You can have rules of evidence. You can have... Um, procedural rules that are very similar to litigation. Um, but arbitration is voluntary. It is typically um, agreed to in an arbitration clause of a contract. Um, it is binding, which means that the, the decision or judgment of the arbitrators is just like the decision or judgment of a court. And the Federal Arbitration Act um, is the act that um, gives arbitration uh, the power of the court to make a decision uh, and that that will be uh, binding on the parties, even though it's contractual and consensual. Um, uh, for some arbitration, uh, the losing party has the right to appeal, but for most, you really don't. That's the decision. Um, kind of what I really want you to remember is that arbitration agreements are found in contracts. It's a creature of contracts. It's, it's not found anywhere else. Um, hold on. Is there a slide for Hooters? No. So let's stick on this slide. I want to talk a little bit about the Hooters case, um, case 4.3 on page 111. Um, so if you have an agreement, and many of you are, have already agreed to arbitration, and uh, an agreement to arbitration really means you're foregoing your right to sue. You, as a contracting party, has agreed that you will not sue, and instead you will arbitrate any disputes that arise under the contract credit card agreements, your cell phone bill. Frequently, doctors will not see you without a arbitration clause. And um, these are traditionally upheld, except in the case where they're manifestly unfair or unconscionable is another nice little legal word, where really it's so one-sided that it's it, it 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 couldn't it it's invalid it's so unfair it invalidates the arbitration and that allows the party to sue so the hooters case briefly is an arbitration agreement in an employee handbook and it was so one-sided toward hooters given the employee very little control over the process the whole point of arbitration is that you have two equal parties creating a process, being able to have input on who the arbitrator is, being able to have input on what rules apply. Are we gonna use the American Arbitration Association um, or another group's rules in litigation? You're just using the state of California rules, but in arbitration and mediation, you're using other rules and you can decide what those rules are. Um, 
but you can't decide because you have more par power than one party to create a process that's manifestly unfair or one-sided. And that's what the Hooters case is. Um, so what I really want you to pay attention to is um, the provisions in the arbitration agreement that the court found unfair. And those are the bullet points in the case. Um, there are many, many employers who have mandatory arbitration agreements in their employee uh, contracts. And California is very um, progressive among states to find them potentially unfair. Uh, consumer contracts sometimes uh, are found to be unfair uh, for, because uh, if the um, product seller has all the power and the consumer has very little power uh, in the creation of the agreement, then it's not a true arbitration agreement. Second nifty um, uh, dispute resolution process is mediation. It's where you typically have one neutral, very informal, it's not contractual. Um, you are um, essentially the mediator uh, is bringing the parties closer together with some kind of agreement and the agreement is not binding it's really just another agreement so mediation is um, uh, less costly uh, very quick sometimes you have an expert you can choose to have an expert um, very consensual where parties are really not forced to go to mediation and the result of the mediation is a settlement agreement that then needs to be formalized by the court as opposed to arbitration where you get a judgment and you can walk into the bank and put liens on accounts with that judgment. So arbitration is much closer to litigation than mediation is. One other potential uh, dispute resolution process is expert evaluation. Um, what this is really is where parties with a complex um, dispute uh, in a, a very, um, it doesn't have to be a unique profession or industry, but in, in, in an industry that the common person isn't familiar with, expert evaluation is where you send your case to an independent expert all your documents, your witness testimony. This is pre-dispute or before the hearing. And you ask that expert, uh, would they recommend settlement? What would the settlement would they recommend? What would be fair? And it's informal. Um, if you take a moment to think about it, you might be able to see how this would benefit. You don't even have to get a mediator. If both parties agree to send the case to expert evaluation, um, or one party sends their side to an expert evaluator and then present to, presents that um, to the opposing party, it's possible that you will come to a settlement more quickly. So business would choose this um, time-saving, uh, face-saving, privacy, uh, person is probably bound by confidentiality. Um, they're not sitting in judgment of you and they're really just consulting and recommending um, settlement. So very interesting alternative for business. Uh, there are hybrid forms of ADR, just meaning that something, a process that might look a little bit like mediation and arbitration, uh, and then allowing um, for the parties to move forward to binding arbitration if the mediation fails. Um, and this is another very valid um, form of dispute resolution that business might choose. Um, could be time saving, uh, could be effort saving, and um, it's just developed over, um, over time uh, in um, business disputing. Um, I really want you to take a look at the American Express case in this um, 
chapter and the Bridgestone case. And what I would like to do is um, add those to your study guide and then provide a quick separate um, review of the study guide um, in a separate um, uh, MP4 uh, um, podcast, if you, if you, if you allow. Um, okay, so that's it for chapter four. Take a look at the learning objectives. I like them. They summarize. Um, they're a great way to start. Um, these slides are a great way to start before you read the chapter um, to summarize the um, main topics um, of that chapter. Okay, so that's it for chapter four, and I will um, see you in class on Thursday.